The year is 1839, and the place is just off the north coast of Cuba. There, a schooner called the Amistad sails in the early morning darkness. On board are the ship's crew, two Cuban plantation owners, and 53 Africans, men, women, and children, purchased a few days earlier at a Havana slave market. The ship is bound for the plantations on the island, plantations where it seems likely the slaves will spend the rest of their lives. It might have been an ordinary day, but the actions of one would-be slave on the Amistad that morning set in motion an improbable series of events. In the end, his actions will create a controversy that comes to command the attention of presidents, ambassadors, and queens, American politicians on both sides of the slavery question, and the United States Supreme Court. The controversy that ensues will preoccupy the public and for abolitionists, create a cause that would build momentum for their great aim to end slavery. Now, the slave who gets all this started is known as Sinke. And on this morning in 1839, he uses a nail he'd hidden under his arm to pick the lock on the iron collar around his neck. After freeing himself, he turns his attention to the locks on his fellow Africans. The mutiny and melee that follows leaves the ship's captain, three crew members, and one African dead. Then the mutineers demand that one of their slave masters turn the schooner around and steer them back across the Atlantic to their African homeland. Instead, the plantation owner, Pedro Montes, tricks them. He steers east during the day, but then he turns west again at night. And for six weeks, the Amistad zigzags north while conditions grow ever more desperate on the ship. After 10 Africans die, Sinke has no choice but to order the Amistad steered to shore. And the shore turns out to be the eastern tip of Long Island, not far from present day East Hampton. Within a day after anchoring just off the coast, the Amistad is spotted from a naval vessel under the command of Lieutenant Thomas Gedney, Gedney orders the seizure of the schooner, its cargo, and the Africans. And while he knows a port in New York is much closer, he brings his prize to a port in New London, Connecticut. Why? Well, most likely, Gedney knows that slavery is illegal in New York, but not in Connecticut. He intends to go to court to seek salvage, basically a percentage of the value of the cargo, including the value the Africans would have as slaves and his prospects might be better in Connecticut. The Amistad carries silk, wine, saddles, and gold, cargo worth about $40,000 in $1839. And the value of the slaves, if sold at auction, might be an additional $25,000. In part, then, this will be a case about money, but it is also going to be a case about the basic rights of people stolen from their African homeland. The trials that follow present three questions that we'll be addressing today. First, are the African mutineers criminals? Second, are they property? And finally, if they are neither criminals nor property, then what should happen to them? Should they be returned to their homeland in Africa? Should they be free to go or stay as they wish? Each of these questions will lead us deeper into a fascinating episode in American history. So let's jump right in and address the first one. Are the Africans of the Amistad criminals? Let's begin with the basic facts. Sinke killed the Amistad's cook with a sugarcane knife. He used the same knife to wound the ship's captain, and then other slaves finished the job by strangling him. At first blush, these actions sound a lot like murder. The slaves also tied up the two plantation owners, and ordered one of them to steer the ship to Africa. Now that seems suspiciously like mutiny. So did the Africans commit a crime? No doubt the Cuban plantation owners considered themselves a victim of a crime. Three days after the Amistad's discovery, 
They filed criminal charges of murder and piracy against the Africans. A reporter described a delighted Pedro Montes on the day he filed criminal charges. Montes, the reporter wrote, sat smoking his Havana on the deck of the ship with a martyr-like serenity. Meanwhile, the other slave owner, Jose Ruiz, predicted to reporters that all the slaves would be sent back to Havana. He expected the ringleaders to be executed and the rest given back to him. A hearing on the criminal charges was held in Connecticut before Judge Andrew Judson. To the Africans, everything said was incomprehensible. Pure gobbledygook. Sinke appeared calm throughout the proceeding. He didn't think things were going well, though. Every once in a while, he made a motion with his hand, suggesting a hanging. This hearing, to be clear, was not a trial. Its purpose was to determine if there was a basis for going forward with a criminal trial. Three witnesses testified, and none of them had sympathy for the Africans. The first mate of the Amistad told of hearing one of the crew members cry murder and then grabbing an oar to fight off the mutineers. Pedro Montes testified that Sinke wounded me on the head severely with one of the sugarcane knives. Then, he said, he ran and tried to hide behind some of the barrels, wrapped in a sail, but it didn't work. Sinke found him and was about to kill him when another one of the Africans talked him out of it. Now, this testimony was enough for Judge, Judge Judson. He ordered the Africans to stand trial for the crimes of murder and piracy. Until then, they were to be housed in the county jail in New Haven. The arrival of the Africans in New Haven sparked excitement. Thousands of curious people visited the jail each day and paid one shilling, about 12 cents, to take a look at them. Things were pretty loose. The sheriff took four of the African children, who ranged in ages from about 10 to 12, on wagon rides. The adults were allowed to exercise on the town green. There they cavorted, did somersaults, and performed acrobatic leaps that surprised the locals. That sort of exuberance must have been an uncommon thing among 19th century residents of Connecticut. New England abolitionists saw the arrival of the Africans more as an opportunity than a curiosity. Abolitionist leader Lewis Tappan, a key figure in the Amistad trial, described the capture of the Africans as a providential occurrence that could touch the heart of the nation through the power of sympathy. The abolitionist publication, The Emancipator, declared that God ordered the Amistad to our shores to hasten the overthrow of slavery. Here was a chance to expose the inhumanity of slavery and abolitionists meant to take advantage of it. Tappan and the other abolitionists formed a committee to defend the Africans. They hired Roger Baldwin to represent them and he turned out to be a good choice. But Baldwin faced an obvious problem. The Africans understood scarcely a word of English and Baldwin knew not a word of Mendi, the language of most of the Africans, a language in spoke, spoken now in parts of what is the nation of Sierra Leone. But New Haven, conveniently, was the home of Yale. Baldwin rounded up a Yale professor of linguistics and an African interpreter to help with his mission. Through his interpreters, Baldwin learned that the Africans actually came from six different tribes and spoke several different languages. They had only been in Cuba a short time before their sale in an Havana slave market. They and over 300 other Africans had made the two-month middle passage to Cuba on a slave ship. The fact that the slaves had recently come from Africa and were not longtime Cuban slaves was hugely important to this case. Why? Well, because an 1817 treaty between Great Britain and Spain prohibited new African slave traffic. The treaty declared free all Africans newly imported into any Spanish port, and Cuba at this time, of course, was a possession of Spain. Only those slaves that had been imported before 1817 or born to slaves in Spanish possessions could continue to be bought and sold. The documents that were issued at the Havana slave market declared that all the Amistad slaves were either born in Cuba or were longtime residents of Cuba. If that were true, it would make them lawful slaves. 
But the documents are patently fraudulent. The simple fact that the slaves could barely understand a word of Spanish made the fraud plain. And banging home the reality of this fraud became the core of Baldwin's defense strategy. The Cubans, the Spanish, and the United States government took different positions. Their argument, stripped down, came to basically this. The judiciary has no business looking into whether there was a fraud. Courts should not look behind the documents. The documents, or passports as they were called, indicate that each one of these was a legal slave and that each passport lists a Spanish name. And that's good enough for us. The United States, through its attorneys, argued that the court must accept these documents at face value as a way of showing respect to a foreign government, or at least as a way of showing respect for the President of the United States, who was concerned about keeping good relations with Spain and other countries. In September, the Africans were taken in canal boats down the Connecticut River to Hartford, where two federal judges and a grand jury were waiting for them. Lawyers, reporters, and interested visitors filled every hotel room in town. People picnicked in the courthouse yard, and vendors hawked engravings of the Amistad. Inside the courthouse, the grand jury had the job of considering whether or not to indict the Africans. If they did, then a criminal trial would follow. Meanwhile, a civil proceeding, raising the issue of whether the Amistad Africans were property, proceeded simultaneously in a different courtroom. For now, let's focus on the criminal matter. The grand jury reviewed the previous testimony of the plantation owners, owners and the cabin boy. From time to time, they shuffled into the courtroom where the civil proceeding was underway to ask Circuit Judge Smith Thompson for guidance. And what Thompson told the grand jurors was this, it's up to you to figure out whether what happened on the Amistad was a crime. The only thing that I can advise you about is jurisdiction. Perhaps Judge Thompson's comments about jurisdiction got the grand jury thinking, because the next time they trotted into court, they came in with a report of their findings. And the really important finding, not a hard one to have made here, was that the killings and the mutiny did not take place within the territorial waters of the United States. And with that, Judge Thompson had what he needed to dispose of the criminal charges. He announced that the court lacked jurisdiction to hear any criminal charges. The crimes, if there were any, were committed against Spanish citizens on a Spanish boat in Spanish waters. Jurisdiction to hear a criminal case could only rest in Spain or in her possessions. There would be no prosecution in his or any U.S. courtroom. Let's count that ruling as half a victory. But Judge Thompson did not do what the abolitionists and the Africans' lawyers most wanted him to do. He refused to issue a writ ordering the immediate release of any of the Africans of the Amistad. Although declining to order their release, the judge made it clear he would have liked to. He said, however abhorrent it may be to our feelings, however desirable that every human being should be set at liberty, we cannot be governed by our feelings, but only by the law. The law convinced him that the district court had the right to keep the Africans in custody, at least until it could decide whether anyone held a property interest in the slaves. In the civil trial, Amistad committee lawyers argued that the Africans were no one's property and were, therefore, entitled to their freedom. Lawyers for the Cubans insisted that the Africans were slaves lawfully purchased in a nation where slaveholding was legal. They should be returned to them as their property. The lawyer for Lieutenant Gedney, the commander of the ship whose crew boarded and then seized the Amistad, argued that his client was entitled to receive salvage, that is, a percentage of the value of the Amistad and its cargo, including their fair market value of slaves. U.S. District Attorney William Holabird, pointing to a 1795 treaty, contended that the Africans should have been placed under the control of President Van Buren. Let the president decide what to do with them, he said. Now, this seems like a holy mess, or at least a real legal knot. We have many different claims made by different lawyers as to how the Africans should be treated. 
Van Buren hoped the judge would agree to turn over the Africans to the executive branch. In anticipation, he issued a secret and controversial, shocking even, some might say, order to the U.S. Marshal in Connecticut. The order was meant to be carried out the minute the judge handed down a decision granting custody to the president. Under the plan, the marshal was to rush all the Africans out of the courthouse and load them into a waiting ship called the U.S. Grampus. The Grampus then would set sail immediately for Cuba before the lawyers for the Africans had a chance to file an appeal. For President Van Buren, a pragmatic politician, the Africans were just pawns in a chess game, pawns that he was willing to sacrifice for what he saw as the larger benefit of maintaining good relations with Spain. This was not a matter of conscience. It was a matter of state. The New Haven courthouse was, was packed on January 11, 1840. Yale students, lucky enough to get seats, refused to leave the courtroom, even during the long recesses for fear of losing their places. Nearly a dozen lawyers representing the Africans, the Spaniards, the salvage claimants, the U.S. government, all huddled at their desks. Roger Baldwin won cheers from a mostly pro-African crowd for his eloquent defense of liberty. A parade of abolitionist witnesses offered evidence of the Africans' non-Cuban origins. One witness testified that Ruiz, back in Cuba now by the time of trial, even admitted that the captives were not legal slaves. Baldwin also introduced the deposition of Dr. Richard Madden, the British anti-slavery commissioner in Cuba. More than any English-speaking person alive, he knew how the Cuban slave trade really worked, and it was not a pretty picture. Madden described how Cuban authorities winked at the slave trade in return for 10 or $15 a slave, how they issued fraudulent documents, and how they would, without any hesitation, kill many of the Amistad's Africans should they be returned to Cuba. Sinkei testified through an interpreter, wrapped in a blanket on the witness stand. He told what happened to him during the five months beginning with his being kidnapped while working on a road near the African home of his wife and three children, and ending with his capture on Long Island. He sat on the courtroom floor to demonstrate how he was manacled, hands and feet together, on the Middle Passage voyage. Mixed with this dramatic testimony were arguments and testimony that only an admiralty lawyer could enjoy. The trial would decide not only the fate of the Africans, but of the Amistad and its cargo as well. Two days later, Judge Judson announced his decision. If he looked out the courthouse window, he could have seen the Grampus anchored in the harbor, ready to bring the Africans to a not very happy end in Cuba, if only he gave the word. But he didn't. Judson began with the salvage claims. He ruled that Gedney rendered a valuable service in seizing the Amistad and preventing the likely loss of its remaining cargo. He awarded the lieutenant one-third of the value of the ship and its non-human cargo. The ship and its cargo, subject to the salvage lien, would be restored to the Spanish government. But, Judson ruled, there would be no salvage right in the Africans. They were no one's property. The Africans were born free and by law still were free. They would not be returned to Cuba to stand trial as accused murderers and pirates. They had been kidnapped in violation of international law. They had every right to mutiny and to attempt to win back their liberty. The judge ordered that they be transported back to Africa, not Cuba. Judson ended his opinion with the words, Sinke and Grabo shall not sigh for Africa in vain. Bloody as may be their hands, they shall yet embrace their kindred. The Grampus sailed out of New Haven, however, without the Africans making Van Buren, one would guess, grumpy. For the abolitionists, though, it was a happy day. Tappan hurried to the New Haven jail to tell the Africans the news. And upon hearing Tappan's words, the Africans fell on their knees before him. They leaped and they shouted in joy. But the Amistad case was not over yet. 
the Van Buren administration appealed, first to the Circuit Court and then to the United States Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, where five of the nine justices either owned or had once owned slaves. Lewis Tappan visited the former president and then congressman, John Quincy Adams. Adams was 74 years old and three decades removed from his last argument in court. Nonetheless, Tappan asked Old Man Eloquent, as Adams was called, to join Roger Baldwin in arguing the African's case in Washington. The former president said that he would. On February 22, 1841, arguments began in the Supreme Court's crowded chamber in the U.S. Capitol. Attorney General Henry Gilpin argued for the government. He told the court that it should not go behind the Amistad's paper and make inquiry into their accuracy. They should instead accept them on their face in order to show proper respect for another sovereign nation. And that means, of course, the Africans should be returned to Cuba. Roger Baldwin argued next for the Africans. Courts can and should look to see if the Cuban paperwork is fraudulent. If the court finds fraud, then treaties should govern, and the Africans should be declared free, free to go home to Africa if they choose, free to stay in the United States if they choose. That was the argument that had persuaded the lower courts, and Baldwin hoped it would convince the justices as well. But the lawyer everyone was waiting to hear was John Quincy Adams. Justice Joseph Story later called Adams' argument extraordinary for its power, for its bitter sarcasm, and for its dealing with topics far beyond the record and points of discussion. It was at times eloquent. It was at times a harangue. And at times it resembled a lecture on political science. Adams argued that if the president had the power to send the Africans to Cuba. He would equally have the power to seize any 40 Americans and then send them overseas for trial. He blasted Spain for its position in the case. He said Spain asked the president to, quote, first turn man robber, next turn jailer, and lastly turn catch pole and convey them to Havana to appease the vengeance of the African slave traders. Adams also let Van Buren have it for ordering a vessel to New Haven Harbor. He asked, was ever such a scene of trickery enacted by the ruler of a great magnanimous and Christian nation? As Adams saw it, this was a simple case. He told the court, the moment you come to the Declaration of Independence, that every man has a right to life and liberty and an alienable right, this case is decided. Two weeks later, the Supreme Court announced its decision. It rested on the arguments of Roger Baldwin. As for the arguments of John Quincy Adams, the court called them, quote, interesting. Joseph Story wrote the opinion. The would-be slaves of the Amistad were kidnapped Africans who by the laws of Spain itself were entitled to their freedom. They were not criminals. The ultimate right of human beings in extreme cases is to apply force against ruinous injustice. So the Africans could stay or they could return to Africa. It was up to them. But which would it be? For the most part, the abolitionists hoped the Africans would choose to stay in the United States, where they could continue to remind people of the evil of slavery. Lewis Tappan moved the Africans to Farmington, Connecticut. There, for the next eight months, they received about six hours of instruction and tended a garden of corn, potatoes, beets, and onions. In addition, they traveled as a sort of pro-abolition vaudeville team around New England. But those close to the Africans saw a change taking place. To the dismay of their spiritual advisors, some sang songs or turned somersaults for shillings. Encounters with local residents were mostly positive, but you know, there were insults, incidents, and even fights. Many were homesick. One African drowned, and people suspected it was a suicide. By September, Tappan knew it was time to send the Africans home. He appealed for clergymen willing to accompany the Africans to their homeland to start a Christian mission there. Two months later, he had several volunteer missionaries and the money necessary to charter and provision a ship. On December 4, 1841, 
Lewis Tappan, a handful of other abolitionists, and the Africans gathered on a steamboat that would take them to a larger ship anchored off Staten Island. Tappan said goodbye and presented each African with a gift, a memento of their two-year stay. Only in fairy tales do people live happily ever after. After 50 days at sea, the ship put down anchor in Freetown Harbor. But it didn't take long for the missionaries to realize they had their work cut out for them. After disembarking, some of the Africans stripped and engaged in what missionaries called heathenish dancing. Soon the missionaries wrote letters complaining of their Amistad students. Some fell back on what the missionaries called their licentious habits. Some disappeared, and others were just trouble. Another slave pleased the missionaries by becoming a minister, but then disappointed them by practicing polygamy. The missionaries, however, could also report success stories, such as Margrew, the young woman who returned to the United States to study at Oberlin College and then spent the rest of her life working on the African mission. The last of the Amistad Africans to have contact with the mission was Sinke. In 1879, old and emaciated, he stumbled into the mission and asked to be buried among the graves of the American missionaries. Although every president from the time of the Amistad decision to the Supreme, of the Supreme Court until 1860 urged that Spain be compensated for its loss, efforts to appropriate funds for such a purpose were blocked consistently by Congress. John Quincy Adams led the opposition to compensation efforts until his death in 1848. He called the proposal a robbery on the people of the United States. With the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860, Spain's efforts came to an end. Lewis Tappan, by the way, in his day job, established the nation's first credit rating agency. Today, the company he founded is called Dun & Bradstreet. There's a reason Steven Spielberg chose to tell the Amistad story in movie form. It's a powerful story, a story that touches hearts and puts a human face on slavery. A story with heroes, heroes ranging from Sin K and the Africans to the abolitionists of the Amistad Committee, to lawyers such as Roger Baldwin and John Quincy Adams. And unlike so many court battles in the 19th century involving the issue of race, justice, at least in rough form, prevailed. Except for one justice on the Supreme Court, every judge who considered the Amistad case sided with the Africans. Many of these judges were supporters of slavery, but the fate of slavery in the United States was not at stake in this case. The lawyers for the Africans, with the exception of John Quincy Adams, avoided directly attacking the institution of slavery. And in fact, the importation of new slaves into the United States had been illegal for more than three decades when the Amistad arrived on Long Island. Justice, natural human sympathies, and the law all pushed in the same direction in this case. And that was enough for the judges. The Amistad trials considered a unique set of facts. It was a complex case involving complicated legal questions. The Supreme Court's decision in the case set no far-reaching precedent. A decade and a half after it decided the Amistad case, the Supreme Court announced its infamous Dred Scott decision, denying Congress the power to prohibit slavery in the territories and concluding that slaves and former slaves could not even be citizens within the meaning of our Constitution. But the trials and the Amistad decision did serve to educate the public. In the end, the Amistad case helped turn public opinion, at least in the North, against slavery. 